start. A very good afternoon to everybody and a very warm welcome to today's event in Conversation Literary Translation in Cameroon. I'm really thrilled to welcome our three speakers this afternoon, who are definitely in the room at the moment. Um, firstly, Dr Georgina Collins. So for, um, for anybody who's joined us here from um, University College Cork, Georgina will be not at all unfamiliar as she joined us um, a kind of like a year and a half ago. I think it was uh, November 2019 now, although it seems a very long time ago, um, to talk about the project that she was doing in Cameroon um, with this early translation. So it's brilliant to welcome her back today um, to talk to us a little bit more about how the project has evolved and where she is with it now. Um, Alongside Georgina, I'm thrilled to also welcome two of the literary translators she's been working with in Cameroon, Unfo Nchinyo and Felicite Ete Enau, um, who are here today um, to talk to us about their uh, bilingual anthology of Cameroonian short stories entitled Your Feet Will Lead You Where Your Heart Is. So I know that we're going to talk much more about that later on and much more about the project. As so just before I give our speakers um, the proper introduction that they absolutely deserve, I just want to go through just um, a couple of housekeeping um, things as well. Um, for anybody who has joined us on a Monday afternoon uh, for one of these sessions already, you'll know that, these, that today's talk is part of a larger series of talks that I've been organising uh, under the guise of reading and translation as part of a project that I've been working at, at University College Cork entitled Reading Across Cultures and our sessions on Monday have included all sorts of different kinds of, um, of, of talk and discussions. We've had talks on um, by publishers, by translators, we've done a reading group session um, and I just wanted to let you know about a couple of the events that we've got coming up in the next month or so. Um, firstly we have our conference um, our, that's coming up on the 17th and the 18th of May entitled Reading in Translation. Um, now the conference um, is I'm really looking forward to because it's kind of bringing together all agents in the kind of translation and publi publishing process and um, to open up dialogues around reading and translation and we've got panels with academics, with translators, with publishers, with readers, with bloggers and we've got names such as Daniel Hahn, Anton Her, Jitanjali Patel, um, Helen Rosallo and Anne Morgan, who are going to be talking at and kind of approaching the subject from various angles. Registration for the conference is open. Um, I've put the link on the screen and the program is also available on the website, which I'll put in the chat in just a minute. Um, so please head over there if you'd like to register. You're more than welcome. The next event that we've, come in, we've got coming up is on the 24th of May. Um, and on translation of identity with Lauren Skill and Leila Benitez James. Um, and um, the, the session on translation and identity is um, kind of the, the idea behind it comes from the um, kind of controversy that came up from the translation of uh, Amanda Gorman's poetry uh, after her appearance at Joe Biden's um, inauguration in January. Um, there was so much talk about. Uh, <laughs> Can I just ask if anybody's got their microphone unmuted? Uh, unmuted, just to mute the microphone, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, so the session on translation and identity is going to deal with some of the controversy that <laughs> sort of of uh, um, the talk about and of poetry, um, and that's been uh, so where can I find out more about um, these events? We have a Facebook page where you can find out all the details of the events that we've done in the past and all the events coming up. The link is on the screen there, so you are more than welcome to head over where you'll find all the information. If you don't, if you're not on Facebook or you'd rather a less uh, uh, a less social media type approach, then my email is also on the screen, so you're more than welcome to get in touch. So, um. Back to today, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our three speakers properly um, now. So, um, as I said, a very, very warm welcome, and thank you so much for joining us. First of all, to Dr. Georgina Collins. Georgina Collins is a freelance French to English translator and literary translation consultant. She has a PhD from Warwick University and previously worked as a lecturer in translation studies 
Georgina specializes in the translation of Francophone African texts and has published a number of academic and professional articles for literary translations. Her translations of Cameroonian poet John Claude Awono's works will appear in the summer 2021 edition of Modern Poetry in Translation. Cette conversation va être enregistrée. Alongside uh, Georgina, I'd also like to welcome Unfo Nchinho. Unfo is a French to English literary translator with a BA combined honours in English and French and an MA in translation. He's also a copy editor at Backward Magazine and Backward Books and an frequent author of poetry. Um, and I know that we're going to hear more about Backward later on as well um, as we go on. Finally, we have Felicity Enal. She's a Cameroonian professional translator currently residing in Yaoundé. She holds a BA in bilingual studies from the University of Yaoundé and an MA in translation from ASTI. She's passionate about languages, communication and literary translation and has over seven years experience translating for direct clients and agencies. Just to let you all know that today's session is being recorded and will be available later on. And if you have any questions, then please pop them in the chat and we'll try and keep our eye on it as we're going along. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much, the three of you for being with us today. And I'll hand over to Georgina to start the session. Thank you ever so much, Jenny, and, and thanks so much for inviting the three of us. Um, it's lovely to talk about a project that we're all really passionate about. Um, so I actually have the book that we're talking about here today. Um, as we said, it's bilingual and it's called Your Feet Will Lead You Where Your Heart Is and Le Crépuscule des Âmes Sœurs. Um, so my role really today is just to give you a little bit of background to the book and the project and, and why the book came apart and um, came um, to take place. And then I'm going to pass on to Enfour and to Felicité um, to talk about their roles, Felicité and Enfour as translators within the book, the short stories, um, and also Enfour as somebody who's a copy editor at Bakwa and who um, played a role with Sakashi Makfiban, um, Bakwa um, founder in editing the book. Um, so to talk a bit about the, the background to the book, um, it's the result really of a collaboration between the University of Bristol and specifically um, Professor Madhu Krishnan and Dr. Ruth Bush, who are here today, um, and also, and, and myself working as a freelancer for um, the University of Bristol, and um, Bakwa as well, as I've mentioned, Zakashi McVeban and, and Ford Jinyo, along with their team. Um, my own involvement um, came about um, back in 2018, really, because um, Ruth and Madhu asked me to conduct a feasibility study uh, into um, literary translation training in West Africa and specifically three different countries, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal and Cameroon. Um, so I went to the three different locations and really I wanted to find out um, how much literary translation training was taking place in these locations um, and translation training in general, um, whether there was a need or a desire to explore literary translation, to provide more training. Um, so what I did was interview over 60 um, people in those three different countries, academics, journalists, writers, translators, students, um, and find out what they um, wanted, what they need, what their um, own experiences are, and really just to see, um, you know, how much literary translation was taking place. Um, and if literary translation training was um, required, then, then how would that um, take shape? Uh, and what did people want? What would that, might that look like? Um, and what I found was that Cameroon was in such a unique position because there are a lot of highly skilled professional translators working in Cameroon across um, different industries in government, in commercial organizations, and working in um, as freelance translators. Um, and um, there are also a number of um, really good university courses at the University of Yaoundé One, at ASTI, at ISTIC, a private mm -hmm. organization. Um, but what we did discuss, and you know, at that time, that's when I met Sakashi and Four for the first time. And so um, we talked a lot about the fact that there was um, a lot of commercial training, a lot of technical training, um, audio visual training. Um, and although there was a lot of passion for literary translation training, that perhaps that took um, second 
from place to some of the more um, some of the other um, industries, if you like. And um, but what also made Cameroon quite unique was the fact that there were two official languages, French and English, meaning that if we were to look at providing some kind of literary translation training, then there being just two um, official languages meant that you you know could easily run a workshop translation between those two languages. That's aside from another issue, which is that there are hundreds of other languages that are spoken in Cameroon alongside um, lingua franca, such as cam franglais and pidgin. Um, there was also um, the question as to why, when Cameroon you know, it produces so much literature, very rich literature, why so much literature was actually leaving Cameroon to be translated when there is um, clearly a lot of translation expertise locally. Um, so at the end of the feasibility study, really, um, my recommendations or the thoughts that we'd had and brought together were that we could um, run a one or two week workshop um, alongside developing this sort of burgeoning literary translation network that we were um, beginning to build um, through the interviews, through Backwards own work, through the work at Bristol Uni. Um, and possibly could do something like a conference in line with that, mentoring and anthology. So these were all discussions that we had at that early stage. So the anthology, um, or the feasibility study, if you like, along with the work of Bacor and Bristol, um, were one of the reasons for producing um, this anthology. Um, and then Professor Madhu Krishnan um, was successful in getting funding to take all of our um, work forward and actually run um, pilot workshops in Yaoundé, the capital of Cameroon. So first of all, there was um, a creative writing workshop that took place in summer 2019, um, run by the team um, that I've mentioned, um, but specifically by award-winning writers Edvige Draw, who took charge of those writing in French, and Billy Kohora, who wrote, um, who worked with those writing in English, really to develop their talents, um, but also to work on their own short stories that would appear in the anthology. Um, so they had a week-long workshop, but then that was followed by mentoring, both with Edvige and Billy, but also um, well-known writers Babila Mutia, Yewandi Omatoso, Florian Ngimbis, and Marcus Bonitega. Um, so they were working on these short stories. In the meantime, we um, ran uh, a translation workshop, um, literary translation workshop in 2019. Um, and those running the workshops were Ross Schwartz, award-winning translator again, translator of a hundred um, books, and also Edvige Edri Draw again, and myself, I worked across the two language groups. The workshop content in terms of the literary translation, we looked at a number of different text genres, so poetry, prose, translating dialogue, children's literature. We looked at African texts, specifically Cameroonian texts, European texts, translating local and non-standard languages. We had some very interesting discussions about Cam Franglais, for example. Um, we also tried our hardest to give people um, a really kind of broad insight into the literary translation industry. So we um, invited local publishers to talk to people and talk about the opportunities available locally. Um, we talked about funding, we did a translation slam, um, and we also had a discussion group at the end of the practical sessions every day, um, debates on the role of the translator, language politics, changing translation trends, that kind of thing, um, but also who the translator should be. And I think, um, and as Jenny mentioned briefly before about one of the forthcoming discussions in this group, but I think what was particularly interesting was this discussion um, of who the translator should be in light of the recent um, debates around Amanda Gorman's poetry. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons why translators in or from Africa in the diaspora aren't always getting um, opportunities to translate African or diasporic literature. But I also think that these issues can be more global too. Um, so the issues of pay, for example, so literary translation, as we've all discussed, is unlikely to be a full-time job for many. It's unlikely to pay the bills. So inevitably, um, more privileged people um, who don't need to worry as much about finance may end up translating more books. Um, there are also go-to translators. So 
um, those who publishers will turn to again and again because inevitably they have the experience, they know them, they know they can deliver, um, but that potentially limits opportunities for others to grow. Um, there's also the issue, I think, of the homogenization of literature. Um, so in translation, so with the same person translating multiple texts, are we flattening um, out, you know, or making voices sound more similar? Um, there's issues of funding, of course. So um, we've got schemes like Pen Translates that provides funding for books, uh, but not every part of the world has um, equivalents. And in terms of African publishing, I think it's quite challenging um, because smaller publishing houses in Africa will find it inevitably uh, more financially challenging to get the rights to books. Now, I'm hoping Phil might talk a little bit more about that. He's, I'm sure he's had more of, a, more of an insight into it than I have. Um, but there also needs to be funding um, for publishers to grow, um, build their own infrastructure and portfolio if they are going to get the rights um, to books. And of course, training is an issue. So. Um, as I mentioned before, translation training will often be um, for commercial and technical translation as this leads to jobs. So literary translation um, isn't always a priority. Um, yet, as we've discussed, um, literary, there is, people want to be literary translators. I think once, when people study translation, it's one of the most exciting forms of translation there is because there, it offers this ability to sort of think and delve deeply into words, meaning, cultures. Um, so there is a need and desire, if you like, um, for translation, literary translation training. Um, we also talked at the workshop about translation interventions, so how much a literary translation, translator should or can manipulate a text. Um, we discussed the possible need to retranslate some African literatures that perhaps lacked mm. an understanding of local cultures and languages, and we spoke specifically about a book um, by Ferdinando Yono called Un Vida Boy, and something that came up in discussions was uh, an example of um, Baton de Manioc that um, many of the translators on the Cameroonian um, workshop um, laughed at the translation as um, cassavistics. Um, so we had long discussions about sort of something or translation into English that had more local resonance, more kind of cultural understanding. And we came up with the word or they came up with the word bobolo. Um, and I'm sure Felicity and Four will talk a little bit more about kind of cultural transfer and, and that kind of thing. We looked at why and if we should be italicizing or glossing words in African languages um, within Francophone and African, uh, Francophone and Anglophone texts. Um, when they're a standard part of local language, um, why is there a need to explain or to highlight? Um, and the idea really was that all these discussions that we were having um, fed into the practical translation um, sessions that were going on as well uh, and really helped the participants to understand and feel confident in their own strategic decisions in translation. So this week of discussion of practical translation um, culminated in a large translation conference um, at the Muna Foundation in the centre of Yaoundé. Um, it brought together this growing network that we've been putting together. So um, the academics, journalists we'd spoken to, interviewees, participants in the workshop, BAKWA, content, um, um, BAKWA contacts um, and writers and translators. Um, and it gave people to, uh, the chance to discuss um, the translation of local languages, the current political climate and its impact on communication, translation, the concept of bilingualism. But it, um, it also gave participants the opportunity to try out their work, um, to read out some of their translation, um, read out the extracts as they were and get a bit of feedback um, as they um, progressed in working on their short stories. So this week long workshop and um, the conference at the end of the week um, was followed by a three month um, mentoring period um, and all the participants worked with either Advige Ros or myself, um, but also award winning um, translators, literary translators, um, Roland Glasser, Mona de Pracontal and Sika Fakambi. Um, and we worked for three months over Skype, just looking at the intricacies of the stories, um, not in not in a sort of teaching way, but in a in a sort of um, 
you know, a dis discursive way um, to try and bring out the, the best out of each of the participants and their individual voices in translation. Um, and once those translations were finished, um, or at least we'd taken them as far as they could and they were submittable to the publisher, um, the translators then had the opportunity to work closely um, with Bakwa um, to refine those stories and get them ready for publication. So really we, what we wanted to do was give everyone that full of it, a full experience of being a literary translator from the beginning to the end in terms of actually um, producing that final anthology. So really today for us is, is um, a bit of a pre-launch um, to the anthology, I'd say. Um, it was meant to be launched last March, um, just as sort of COVID um, hit. So um, we put it back in the hope that we could all come back together again um, and celebrate this and, um, you know, uh, read the extracts and have more discussions. Um, but we put it back to, due to COVID. But um, we hope now that it will take place online over um, the next few weeks. Um, so that's quite an exciting thing to look forward to. Um, so just to finish up, um, the book features um, 10 short stories, um, four originally in French, six in English, um, all translated into the other language. Some of the translations are done collaboratively and the four um, worked in collaboration on his, so I'm sure he'll speak a little bit more about that. And um, Felicite worked on her own, so it'd be interesting to hear um, potentially the you know, how their different experiences were. Um, and um, yeah, it was um, incredibly diverse in terms of subject matter. I'm going to read a very, very brief um, paragraph in the anthology introduction, just to give you an idea of the diversity. It says, um, this bilingual anthology highlights new directions in the Cameroonian short story with stories moving from fantasy through existentialism and afro jujuism to realism. An unusual narrator in Spittle Royale walks the fine line between empathy, uh, radicalization and primal instincts. In Finding Jaman, a correctional facility cleaner collects objects belonging to executed inmates, leading to an interesting discovery. In the eponymous story, siblings reconnect after 40 years apart unearthing secrets that will change their lives forever. It sounds intriguing and it is. It's a really good book that I think you'd enjoy um, reading. Um, but I think what's will be exciting now is to hear more from the translators themselves, um, both of whom did fantastic jobs on the book. Um, so Felicity and Four, um, I don't know if Felicity would like a little bit more time to um, to bed in, um, but thanks for listening to me and, and I'll hand back to Jenny to, to connect to the next of you. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Georgina. <clears throat> um, as a brilliant introduction to, um, to, the, to, to the project and to the book, so it'd be great now to, to listen to, to some specific examples. Uh, N4, do you want to go next? And tell us about your experience? Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh. Hello. Uh, Hi, Felicity. Well, should we start with them for? Is that okay? And then we'll come to you afterwards. Go on, and far off you go. Okay. Hi, hey, Jenny. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, looks like uh, Felicity is trying to come on. That's fine. You carry on. That's fine. Okay, so uh, hello everyone, for Edwin here, yeah. and I'm happy to be talking to all of you today again. It's been a while, and uh, uh, this has been an interesting project, and it's so much uh, that I don't know where to start, but I think I'll start by talking a bit about Bakwa, Bakwa which is uh, more or less at the origin with a uh, University of Bristol of uh, this project. So Bakwa was born in uh, 2013. Yes, by uh, founded in 2013 by Zakashu Magidan. Started as a magazine, Bakwa magazine, which uh, sought to highlight uh, Cameroonian writing, especially by young writers who weren't getting much attention. Over time, uh, Bakwa has grown to, to embrace several forms of uh, several media. 
So apart from organizing, now we have a Bakwa Books, which is an indie publisher. We have a Bakwa Cast, which is a podcast trying to connect uh, writers and their communities. And then we have the Bakwa Magazine Reading Series, which uh, involves putting uh, writers in touch with communities. Then uh, well, what else do we have? Then uh, very shortly, we'll probably be having, we'll be having a, an imprint of Bakwa coming up, uh, which is a Kumba book aimed at um, providing um, younger writers or journey mainstream, uh, more writers with a mainstream of the opportunity for, for publishing because Bokka Book is more of a niche and it has a particular target it aims to, to reach. So this anthology, which was uh, produced uh, in collaboration with, uh, um, with the University of Bristol, as uh, was mentioned earlier by Georgina, started with a, a writer's workshop a young writers workshop where we try to groom uh, some, some of our young writers if on creative writing after that we had a creative um, uh, a literary translation workshop where we had uh, several uh, participants both the uh, english uh, translators and french translators over a whole week here in yaounde this was followed by mentorship after stories were assigned to, to each um, to, to each translator or uh, team of translators. Personally, I worked with uh, Janji Melvin Jansi on uh, Un Batayo Krasha. So Un Batayo Krasha is a story of um, the recounting of a student strike at the University of Mbaikele in the 90s. So it's told from the point of view of, uh, probably I shouldn't spoil that, but uh, it's uh, an intriguing story that we found quite interesting and challenging uh, to translate. So uh, I don't know, uh, what would you prefer? Should I uh, speak a bit about uh, publishing in Cameroon and in relation to translation before getting into the story itself proper? You'd like me to do the reading, Jenny? Jenny? Maybe it'd be good if you talk to us a little bit and then we could have the reading afterwards. It'd be interesting to kind of contextualize it with kind of the, the wider publishing industry first and then hear the story. Okay. Yes. Okay. So publishing in Cameroon is uh, kind of <clears throat> not just Cameroon, it's um, in most of Africa is running through has many infrastructural issues. Uh, publishing locally, publishing quality is uh, quite challenging. And publishing quality, uh, quality of both the, the the books themselves and the content of the books is uh, uh, not an easy easy journey. So when we set out with Bakwa, when we got to with Bakwa magazine, the, first of all, it was to get people to start writing again because we had an old generation of writers. After a while, it died down, and it felt like uh, writing had become like obsolete. It is not obsolete, but Generally, um, writing became a thing of the academic elite. So Bakwa sought to level the playing field to get those who were not part of the academia into writing and publishing again. So uh, we did that with Bakwa magazine, and which uh, ran from 2013. Initially, it was meant to offer issues per year, but we later reverted to a one issue per year uh, uh, time frame. So with um, produced or like published many young writers, award-winning writers. And we are in the future is that we lack infrastructure. So most books that would get beyond distribution, the local industry has issues when it comes to infrastructure. So it's not just distribution, it's printing itself, getting the right quality. I think uh, Mariette who's within, with us here just published her second um, collection of short stories and she has experienced what it means to, to work with a local printer and all the hurdles you have to go through to be able to publish something that's at least decent. So it's a major challenge for us. It's a major challenge for everyone. Now, when you come, when you couple that with um, with translation, which initially was uh, was was introduced as a means of promoting the country's uh, state bilingualism. So the focus at the very beginning of training, and I guess even up till now, was more in uh, was more on 
producing translators who will be able to serve the goals or the objectives of the state, that is promoting by resolving, enabling the state to um, get its information and across to citizens, uh, English speaking and French speaking alike. So it's been uh, the first school, the first local transition school, which is ASPE, opened in 1985. And since then, the syllabus hasn't changed very much. And we still mostly on producing translators who would be, who in principle, should be absorbed into the public service to serve uh, the government and its needs. Unfortunately, uh, things have evolved. And since about uh, 1999, the government stopped absorbing those translators into the system, meaning that everyone who came after 99 had to start fending for themselves, looking for a market. Uh, and it was kind of, uh, it's kind of still a difficult journey for most people who graduate. So when you take that into consideration, you realize that the training, as I said, was geared towards institutional needs. So literary translation and uh, uh, commercial translation, for example, weren't the focus of training. These days and these, in the past years, there's been efforts, even at ASPE, to widen the scope of training, to make sure that uh, translators are, are equipped to actually be able to take on the literary, not just literary, on the general translation market, be it commercial, stuff like transcreation. But literary translation is still not a, a focus, just like the others. You would generally have like an elective that focuses on, on those uh, projects like translating into African languages, translating for uh, advertising or commercial purposes, uh, translation. So it's still not a focus and it's still not a specialization for now. When you take that into consideration and realize that most everyone who, who gets out of school generally goes into the market trying to find their own customers. And that literary translation is not something that you can immediately right, right off the bat start earning money from. Most people focus on commercial translation. So it'd be translating for direct clients with projects that have like uh, quick turnovers and um, uh, require much attention and focus and not much time for creation. This has shaped the way most of us approach translation. And I had, a, I had difficulties with that. I still have difficulties with that when it comes to literary translation, which I've not had much uh, time to do to my, uh, uh, my duties, both at the, the, my main employer and at Bakwa. But you realize that for most of us, uh, we work with very tight time frames. So after graduating and working in environments where you had like short projects or long projects, which you had to hand in with very short time frames, short deadlines, it becomes more of a chore and uh, an automatic process where you don't really have the time or the luxury to look into the details of the creativity of translation. So delving into this, into the anthology was a bit challenging. First of all, in job friend schedules, mine and in Chanji's schedule, and then now uh, trying to fit in, in into that um, that mind frame of having to think through every word and every sentence to make the right choices or the most appropriate choices, it was a uh, um, it was challenging, challenging. Now, when you get into the details of the transition process proper and the choices we had to make, we came upon hurdles and uh, there were many. Uh, instances where we questioned what we were doing and in the end the choices we made were probably not the best but the choices we were happy with and we are proud of so um, probably uh, from here now I will delve into the translation and the, the short story proper if uh, anyone has any question later about the publishing landscape I'd be happy to, to get uh, get onto that. So I'm trying to skim through an overview and then get straight to, to the book itself. So um, given that uh, we couldn't get to, um, to, to an agreement, anyway, not agreement, we didn't have much time. It's not that three, like the months we had were short, but given our duties that we had, we couldn't really meet Chanji and I to iron out um, to set out a plan, how to work. So finally, what we decided was we'd have one person translate and then the other go through, give their own um, 
with fresh eyes, then adjust, and then we discuss the, the results before meeting our mentor, who was um, Georgina. And uh, there were quite a few times when we, we couldn't come to, to terms, we couldn't agree in the end, but at the end, we just said, okay, let's choose one. Then after talking with the mentor, we could actually maybe come to a final decision. Uh, one of the main challenges we had was with the book itself. So it's set in Cameroon. And as we, we mentioned earlier, the official languages are French and English. But in between, after that, you have um, several other languages like the lingua franca that, uh, that are very common among both the young and the old. First, uh, among the French speaking, uh, French speaking, mostly French speaking community, you have um, uh, Camp Franglais. Uh, which is uh, kind of like a mix of uh, English, French, uh, local languages, and uh, some some pidgin in some cases. Then you have um, pidgin English, which uh, is uh, generally mostly spoken, uh, not mostly, yeah, I think uh, even in French speaking uh, parts of Cameroon, you also have um, pidgin speakers. So uh, those are the dominant. So you have uh, Camp Franglais and you have Pidgin English. Now, when we came upon a, 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 upon a portion of the book where you have a, a policeman who's uh, interacting with a, a protagonist. So it happens, so happens that the policeman is speaking French and sometimes it's, it's difficult to decipher between what is standard French and what is Cameroon French and what falls in the realm of Camp Franglais. Now we had a dilemma of choosing, what do we go with? Are we going to translate that into standard English or are we going to, to the, put it in English, in Pidgin? Or what do we do? Now it became, another issue came into play because we were working on this anthology. The, the target wasn't just Cameroon. So if we decided to go with just Pidgin, we would have an issue where probably anyone reading out of Cameroon would not be able to understand what was going on. Now, if we took away Pidgin or Kampangle and we used uh, just English, the local audience probably wouldn't really recognize the, flavor, the local flavor in the, in the book. So in the end, we had a mix of both um, Pidgin and English, which was kind of off script. That wasn't part of what the author had in mind. But we were like, if we're supposed to keep some of the local flavor, at least let's do a midway, a bit of pigeon and then some English. That way, nobody gets lost. Like, everybody is served, and at least we try to make everyone happy. It was very exper experimental as a project. So I think we took a lot of liberties, which was, uh, I think, has helped a lot because it, it, uh, it gets us out of this this uh, mind frame where we are like our choices are limited and our time is limited and we have to make choices that must fit in a certain context. So it gave us that, uh, I think for me personally, it, it uh, enabled me to, to, to free my creative juices if I may call it that way. So I worked, later I worked on, a, on one short story that should be published or I don't know if it has been released yet or if it's planned, if there's plans to release it. And I came up upon the same issues again, where it wasn't meant for a Cameroonian audience, but it was meant for an African audience, an English speaking audience that doesn't have a uh, pigeon. So the challenge again was that one, the short story was written in, in Camp Franglais, not because there's standard French, Cameroon French, then there's Camp Franglais in it. So the challenge was, okay, do I translate into English since this community wouldn't probably understand uh, pigeon if I put it in pigeon? Or do I do English? And in the end, I decided to do hybrid again. So some English and some pidgin. But for that, I chose to gloss because as much as uh, it's a political decision for us at Bakwa, we don't italicize words that are not English or French. It's a political decision because it's like othering uh, languages. Like, okay, this is maybe substandard. So we make sure we put every language on the same pedestal. But for this, I personally chose to go to go off script because I knew that the audience would probably not understand. So I decided to gloss and give some explanations uh, of what the words and the expressions in Pigeon and Cameroon Pigeon meant so that the audience wouldn't be lost. So getting back to this, uh, I don't know, should I read um, uh, just a portion because it can be quite long or? 
yeah maybe just read a section from it i mean we've got we've got time but i don't know how long it is <laughs> okay okay so i'll read the portion where we had the the conversation between the the policeman conversation of course this is more of a one-way conversation between the policeman and the, and the protagonist. So what's happening here is uh, there's a riot or a strike on campus, and then the police is called in to kind of quell, uh, it may call quell, uh, yeah, kind of subdue the, the, the uprising. So we have someone who gets caught in the, in the crossfires, if I may say so. So, no. the certainty of defeat looms over the full hardy students still standing up to the police. They watched their schoolmates writhing in pain, fractured arms, broken teeth, battered faces. I decided to head home. How could anyone continue living in this deathly place? A deathly place where grass grows brazenly, even at the entrance to the university restaurant? A restaurant where sprawling mold ate away at the malls, at the walls, leaving them looking leprous? I crossed the yard as as though in a walking dream, relieving scenes of these students pushing and shoving one another in queues. I would go there every afternoon and evening to feast on pieces of fish, morsels of bread, grains of rice stuck to the plate of a student who didn't finish their food, who hadn't finished their food, either out of pride or lack of appetite. I relished it. God is merciful. Walking, uh, walking across the yard, I came upon an avocado, Whilst enjoying it, I heard a scream of agony a dozen meters away. Was that man or beast? A breeze blew, bending the shrub. I saw a man in the bushes, dressed in khaki. He was definitely a police officer. I cleaned my lips with a lick of the tongue and rushed to respond to the scream. The police officer was strangling Awulu, our neighbor from room D14. The students could barely breathe. His eyes were bulging from their sockets. Strangely enough, not a single tear ran down his cheeks. Yet you could see from his agitation that the pain had reached its peak. The scene was awful, reminiscent of a pig singing its swan song in the hands of a butcher. My blood ran cold. Police, the police officer let go of him. He breathed in deeply, coughing repeatedly, then tried to escape. But the officer pinned him against the handrail and kicked him in the back. Loser, what year are you in? Awulu stayed mute. He continued inhaling and exhaling like a dying man awaiting the anointing of the sick. I am talking to you, idiot. Are you dumb? He barked. The student swallowed twice. I am, I am in year four, sir, he quivered. The police officer took a packet of cigarettes from one of his pockets while crushing the victim's thigh with his huge black boot. He pulled out a cigarette, lit it, took a drag, and several seconds later, blew thick smoke into the air. Then he produced a sachet of King Arthur whiskey from the same pocket, tore it open with his teeth, and emptied the contents in one gulp. One of the on the, out of the corner of his eye, Aulu looked at him as if wanting to ask for the cigarette butt. Young man, all is fair in war. Do you hear me? Until you become a DO, an SEO, or a governor with those certificates of yours, I will discipline you. Repeat after me, it's not that hard. Let's go. A degree is no match for a first school. Repeat. I will look at a scornful look at the officer who slapped him so hard that he left an imprint on the student's face. Two rays of tears trickled down from his eyes to stagnate on his upper lip. The officer wouldn't give up. First school pass degree, repeat. He orders once more. The term first school did not seem to be part of Aouli's vocabulary. He refused to talk. I circled them, approaching stealthily. As I hid behind a mango tree opposite the officer, opposite the police officer, I rustled the dead leaves beneath with my feet. When he looked up, I pounced and spat into his eyes. He went blind there and, there and then I took to the heels. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. Are you getting the with yeah. dialogue in there as well? They get it's a challenge as well. But apart from all the other things, but creating that dialogue in translation is still mm -hmm. a challenge. Yeah. I'm sure we've got lots and lots of questions for you. I know that yeah. I've got questions as well. Yeah. Let me um, pass on to Felicity 
and then and then yeah. maybe the other questions and maybe we can pick some of the uh, the other things that you talked about and, and go into those a little bit deeper after so that be okay okay thank you um so let's mm. pass on to felicity and i think she's going to talk to us about her experience as well of, of being part of the projects and and the stories that she's translated and and, and what she's been involved in hi felicity hi jenny hi everyone <laughs> I'm really very sorry for, for coming on board very late. Just had some little technical issues. <laughs> well, I think I will just uh, get into uh, what I have to say. Um, before I could get, uh, be, before I could be part of um, the literary translation workshop, um, Georgina came uh, with some other colleagues to Cameroon and we met with her and uh, we discussed on a possible literary translation watch workshop. And subsequently, I, uh, through BAKWA, I was chosen to be part of um, that workshop, that workshop that took place uh, in 2019, October 2019. And I must say that the workshop was very interesting, it was quite interesting. It was an awesome experience that I had. It, we had um, a five, five day um, interactive sessions with our tutors. Um, and every session, every, I mean, it was so interesting because we had new things at every session. I mean, nothing was the same. I mean, if we had to translate uh, uh, something in the morning, later in the evening, we'll have a talk because uh, uh, before the workshop, we had um, uh, a few articles, some articles that were sent to us that we we're supposed to read and we we're supposed to have several discussions on these articles. I mean, every, every session, every day had a different article. We we're supposed to discuss on each of the articles. We had about six of them. And on the last day, which was the 25th of, uh, uh, of October, we had two articles we're supposed to discuss on. And uh, with, our, with our tutors, it was, everything was interactive. We had so much to say, we had so much to, to share. And what they gave to us, what they gave to us was really, was really enriching because um, I've never really been involved in literary translation before. I did it in school as a course, and after I left school, I got into um, the translation of uh, general text, uh, economic text, uh, 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 transcripts, and any of and all the other texts that I got to translate, but never literary translation. And I have always loved reading. I've always loved literature. I've always loved books. So when Bakwa launched uh, this literary translation workshop, it was just an opportunity that I couldn't miss. And I bet you I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot to, to the point where I just couldn't stop. I mean, I remember, I remember uh, the session, there was a, a translation slam that was between um, uh, one French into English translator, uh, Rose Schwartz, and uh, Edris Tro. They had to translate um, uh, a part of uh, Sonny Labou's uh, novel. And then they were supposed to compare their translations. And I bet it was so interesting. It wasn't like we're trying to find out which translation was best. No, they were trying to give um, uh, their suggestions and reasons why the, the, the chose that particular sentence or phrase or, 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 yeah, or phrase for a particular um, source text. And I bet you it was so interesting. And that, was, that wasn't that was all. We also had um, uh, uh, a session where uh, 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 English into French uh, translators translated um, uh, Jane Austen's, uh, an excerpt from Jane Austen's novels into Camp Franklin. Uh, Ed, Ed, Edwin was just talking about Cam Franklin, and it was so interesting. It was so interesting how you could bring out some of those um, those uh, French words. I mean English English sentences, and then actually bring translate them into Cam Franklin. It was so funny, so interesting, but so enriching. I mean, I I I, I took home 
a lot of things, a lot of things. I learned a lot of things. And even during the, um, the uh, translation process, uh, uh, translating uh, my story, um, actually, uh, I translated uh, Les Crépuscules des âmes sœurs. The English, your feet will lead you where your heart is. It was, it was quite a journey for me. It was quite a journey for me. I remember when I sent my first draft, <laughs> Rose, who was uh, my uh, uh, mentor, she asked me if I really understood what uh, was meant by first draft. Because to her, <laughs> it was like I, have, I hadn't done anything. So I almost felt discouraged because I thought I had put in so much, but yet I had not reached that threshold. So I, I felt like I hadn't even started. I hadn't done anything and I almost gave up. But yet, um, given that, uh, I mean, you always have to come across challenges, those things happen. I, uh, I put down my foot and I did a second draft and behold, she congratulated me. And she was like, ah, I see it, it, it's beginning to sound like something. It's beginning to sound like a translation. Yeah. And we had um, uh, a few, that was one of the challenges. And getting into the translation, I, I remember there was one really challenging part uh, of uh, the text. I remember during one of our sessions, we discussed on um, translating, uh, translating uh, cultures, translating cultures from one, moving from one culture to another. And in my text, I had a, a, a section where uh, in the French, in the French, the, um, the author, the author used the author said something like, uh, vous ne devrez pas me tutoyer, something like that. And that, that uh, idea doesn't exist in English. Uh, we don't, we, uh, I mean, in English, we don't, we don't uh, use vous. Oh, no. Let's see if... She jumps back on again. I guess this is a problem with truly international zooming. <laughs> the, te the technology, we can't guarantee it's going to work. She may not realise she's frozen. Um, I, I'll, I'll message her. Let's see if she's dropped out. Sorry about this, everybody. I think she might have dropped out. Yeah, I think we I think she's um she's disconnected. Um while we wait and see if she um reappears back in, I wonder if um we might um think if anybody has any questions um that they might like to ask um either um Unfor or or Georgina in the meantime while we wait and see if um Felicity um reconnects then um please you're welcome to um unmute yourself or or put it in the chat whichever way um i'm a, and I, i'm happy if you if you want to ask a question yourself or i'm happy to do that for you um while people are maybe thinking about their questions a little bit i would like to know um a little bit how you chose the stories that are included in the anthology and and kind of the um, the involvement of the authors as well. I think it would be interesting to talk about. I don't know who I think that might be one from four, um, because there was the choice of the creative writing stories before we even got to the translation side. So, mm. Mm. okay. Um, so um, yeah, about the the stories, how the stories are chosen. So uh, part of the project, this book being part of the project, where we we had the first part. 
with um, anyway on the sidelines or the research uh, Georgina and Ruth were running. Then uh, we started on the book side when it comes, comes to the book. We started with a short story um, workshop and participants were, were requested to apply with a sample and uh, based on the samples, we chose, um, we shortlisted a few who were supposed to take part in the, cre in the creative writing workshop. So at the end of the creative writing workshop, uh, the writers, the young writers were paired with uh, mentors who were supposed to help them develop their stories to, to maturity. So um, at the end of the workshop, uh, both the French, there were two workshops actually running at the same time, one for the English speaking writers and one for the French speaking writers. So at the end, uh, the authors were, were paired with their, um, with their mentors and the editing process, which was quite challenging, in the end saw uh, one or two people drop out because uh, like, we said, like I said earlier, Bakwa is very keen when it comes to, to quality. So the quality of the story is to be top notch. Yes, we, we gave them uh, enough um, uh, time and enough mentoring and enough uh, attention for them to, to, to work on their stories and mature them. But some people actually like uh, dropped out because they found it to be too gru gruesome, right? It was difficult for them. And probably they felt that reached their, their limit. So in the end, we had a shortage of stories when it comes to the English translation workshop. Since the stories were supposed to, the translation was supposed to work on stories that came from the translation workshop, from the, sorry, from the short story uh, workshop. So in the end, we had to um, turn to uh, stories we curated. We curated two stories, which are from uh, previous works, previous Bakwa work. Yeah, we have um, uh, uh, Things the World Didn't Tell You by, um, by Howard um, Mebu Maximus, who uh, last year won the My Small and Prize uh, fund for to take a, a sabbatical and write his story. So uh, we also had um, uh, Life Savers by Monique Pachu. These stories where we curated them from a previous uh, Bakwa workshop. So we had a Bakwa workshop which was supposed to end up in an anthology. Mm, this anthology of Passion and Ink. So in the end, when we, when we couldn't um, get all the stories from the English workshop, we decided to look into these stories and found ones that had interesting themes and uh, that tied into the, the, the main idea, the main concept of the anthology, which was about empathy, empathy between communities and empathy be between people. Uh, probably we did, I didn't mention this earlier, but the, this project as a whole is part of an uh, effort towards um, encouraging cross-community dialogue towards, uh, uh, like everyone knows, uh, we have a crisis that's been raging in the country that's gone into full-blown war since 2016 and it's sparked, started as a language. It's masquerade as a language issue, but it's not a language issue, it's a cultural issue. And we believe that uh, maybe empathy and cross-cultural communication could have helped to, to quell this before it ever got to this level. So this was like part of an effort to, towards that, towards creating some empathy, having uh, one community read through the stories of the other community to realize that in the end, we are just human beings with the same issues and that language or culture or history shouldn't be what finally uh, breaks. So when the stories um, didn't match up, we chose these two stories and we added them so that all the, uh, the translators on the English, uh, in the English workshop would have um, material to work with. So that's how the stories came about. So firstly, there were, yeah, there were young writers workshops that we organized, we mentored them and they produced the work, the short story that was supposed to serve as working material for the translators in the creative uh, literary translation workshop. So. Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to add that that's one of the reasons why um, the translators, some of them ended up working collaboratively, because we expected there to be one creative writing story per translator. And um, you know, we um, formed the translation workshop in that way that they there would be, I think we ended up with six and seven in the translation workshop um, in the two different languages. So because the standard was so high, um, so and everybody ended up 
working on a on a story yeah it meant that some of them had to work collaboratively but I thought that was quite it was it was a good thing because that's something that translators have to do sometimes and even if you work on a short story yourself inevitably then you know you send your work to other people for them to read for them to feedback you've got the editing process etc so in a way although you know I'm sure some people thought why well, can't I have my own story I thought it's quite representative of reality that some were collaborative efforts some weren't etc and I think you know it, it, it brought the best out of, of people as well. And were the authors involved at all in the in the translation process so was there collaboratively ac across everybody did, did, they, did, did the translator speak to the authors and as well? It depended and I've not spoken to absolutely everybody and if, I'm sure and Ford can talk about his experience mm. um, but I know that some people didn't speak to the authors at all they, they didn't have any questions and they got on with the job um, at hand and there may have been many reasons for that um, and some of the time that's because somebody was working exceptionally hard and trying to get this done as quickly as they could and they felt that they didn't have you know any burning questions and other people had quite regular contact over whatsapp and or maybe phoned up with a couple of questions so I think it depended on the individual um, and I'll hand over to him to talk about his own experience. Yes. I'll plead guilty as charged. We were one of those groups that didn't actually reach out to the author. It was planned though. We we actually uh, intended to reach out to the author at the end of the process. So our intention was work on the on the on the on the short story, have our translation, then in the end have a chat with the author to see if we actually like uh, maybe convey the vision they had for the story. I know uh, for a fact that he was a bit irritated. I don't know if irritated is the word, but he was a bit worried when, um, uh, as I got from other writers, when uh, we didn't reach out to him. And he was like, okay, my story is kind of peculiar. I'm writing about uh, a particular, peculiar character, a particular a peculiar um, protagonist, and a particular peculiar issue. And I'm wondering if these guys know what they're doing. Uh, and I guess, uh, Typical, like I said, our schedules actually we had to um, to work around to work around our schedules, mine and Chandi's, and in the end we ran out of time, so that we couldn't really talk to the author as we planned to. But for after we talked to the author after the whole editing process was done, and uh, after he had a look, he actually was happy with the, with the, with the result actually. And uh, he gave us kudos for it. And I'm happy it turned out that way because I wouldn't have forgiven myself if in the end uh, we produced something he wasn't proud of or didn't like. But for people like uh, Felicite, I know for a fact that she was in constant uh, communication with uh, the author and that she is not the only one anyway. Uh, Mariette who worked on the Howard story, they actually, they actually changed. That they had. So that's about it. I was going to add as well that um, we've done some short videos that are going to hopefully be appearing on um, the Bakwa YouTube channel um, mm -hmm. and they're dialogues between some of the writers and translators so um, we can let people know when when those come out. Um, but I should also add that some of the writers didn't want to get involved. <laughs> you know sometimes people have written their story and then you know that's their story and then you know they're happy to pass mm -hmm. that on. Um, for someone to recreate it in another language so there's that there's that aspect of things too I think. Yes uh, I think some of the authors were uh, some people like I said the, the editing process for the short stories themselves before the translation was kind of tough for many people so at the end some people didn't just want to get involved with the story anymore like I've had enough of it like <laughs> yeah so there was some of that too. And I think that's that's representative of literary translation generally too you know, I've had um, experiences where, you know, an author has been back, very much back and forward and other experiences where I've either had to work through a publisher to get a couple of questions out to them or there's not, not been any communication possible at all. So I think the experiences that a lot of the people involved in the book had were quite representative of more sort of global issues. We have a question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> um, and um, for, uh, it's, sorry. Uh, Ray, who's asking, how do you feel about this very translation in Cameroon since this journey started? Um, 
And regarding the returns from that collection of short stories, are people considering really engaging local translators into major projects? So has it, I guess the, the question is, has, has the project had an impact on, on literary translation in Cameroon? Or do you think it will? And maybe it's too soon to say, I guess, as well. But do you think it will have an impact? Uh, I think, uh, am I taking that? Yeah, I think I'm taking that. So personally, yes, it's had an impact because um, uh, it's true that the impact will be limited because I what I realized is that uh, with our schedules, like the life we had before this workshop, before this project, nothing has changed much. We see have the same issues, we see have to pay rent, we see have to like make money for the bills. So most people, uh, it's difficult first of all, getting the opportunities when it comes to the literary translation. Now, when it comes to actually like people maybe focusing that much on it, it's going to be a long journey for people to, to get on board and really think of it as something they can specialize and focus on. But beyond that, we've had, um, uh, for Bakwa, for example, the project has, has, um, has had an, an impact. I don't think it's just for us, but it's drawn attention to the potential that we have on the continent and in the country. And uh, I think a few people have been, have been contacted for, for literary translation jobs. Uh, we still have issues because not everyone knows how to go about it, uh, what's to, what discussions are to be had with the authors or with the publishing houses, how the publishing process and how the application and all that goes. So locally, we, we don't, it's not yet something we will consider like why well, know what's happened elsewhere is that people translate and they pitch to publishers. Here, publishing is already an issue. Publishing for authors is already an issue. Talk less of having translators pitch their books to, um, to, to publishers. And like I said, books, the book industry here for, for now is mostly something that's for the institution. Like if the book is not going to go into the academic or the curricula, it's going to be difficult for you to get it into the mainstream. So yes, for me, it's had an impact. Uh, a few people have, um, have had uh, proposals for stuff to work on. I personally have had uh, one and two that I had to decline because like I said, uh, I actually struggle a clear catch up between uh, my duties with my main employer and with uh, Bakwa. So it's actually difficult for me to get into a, into a long-term project, literary transition project for now. But I think it's opened the eyes of a few and hopefully with time we'll be able to, to build on that and take it to the next level. Thank you. I'm very happy. Uh, yes, and, and also, <laughs> and also I, I think Ray could also have an input in this because he is someone who has been in the publishing industry for a while. He's worked with uh, maybe the best of the best. And he's had he has a, a an overview of what the industry looks like, and probably he could have a word or two to say, and maybe point out something that I left out. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just Felicity, are you with us now? Felicity, can you hear me? Felicity's re re I can see her re that she's rejoined us, but I don't know if I don't know if we've got contact. I I I, if, I, I know times are going on, and it would be really great to hear her reading if it's possible to do so. I just mentioned something to do with Felicity Walsh, and hopefully she comes through. Um, but I know she's had offers of work. Um, a couple of short stories, which fingers crossed, I think she's doing samples at the moment. So fingers crossed um, that will, you know, that's her next stepping stone, but it looks like she's here. So I'll, I'll shut up. Felicity, it'd be really lovely to hear your reading before you, <laughs> before we lose contact again. Would you like to do your reading for us while you're still here with us before we have to finish? Hello. Oh. Yes. Um... I'm really sorry, my network is, uh, it's really uh, an issue. Hello? Yeah, no, we can hear you. Shall we, shall we give it a go and see if we can get a reading? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, I should uh, go directly into the reading. Hello? 
Yes, that would be great. There's a massive delay, so don't worry. Okay, all right. Um, I'm going to read um, a portion. It's towards uh, the end. It's, it's actually a love story uh, between two people who, who fell in love and where forcefully they had to separate because um, they found out they were siblings. Um, the girl's father got married to the boy's father, so they were forced to, to separate. And uh, they met again uh, 40 years later. And so um, I'm just... No, I think I think we've lost her again. It's going to read a portion. So it says it goes stand up like at the beginning of his humanitarian trips, he kept away from winched all that. No, she's gone again. We've completely lost her again. Oh, I'm really sorry, everybody. It's a real shame that um, we can't hear her reading. It would be really nice. Would you like me to read a bit of her translation? It would be nice, wouldn't it, I think? I haven't, I haven't selected a particular extract but I could, I can just read from the beginning for a little bit. That would be lovely. If my pronunciation at any point is a little bit dodgy, just please excuse me. I've, I've read this in my head, but I haven't read it out loud before. So, um, but yes, so your feet will lead you where your heart is. With her usual jaunty step, Malima walked to Jeforby Bakery to buy wholemeal bread for breakfast. She waved at Mohammed, the shopkeeper in passing, then at young Alain, who had just opened an electronic shop selling telephones, accessories and light bulbs. A little further on, between a house under construction and a stony alley, there was a so-called born-again church where the faithful sing songs of praise at the top of their voices for their Sunday service. Amused, Mulema glanced towards the church and, at the corner of the alley, entered the bakery. She cheerfully greeted Eposi, the assistant, who knew exactly what she wanted without having to ask. She was one of the few people, if not the only person, everyone found pleasant and endearing. And as a result, the shopkeepers all made, them think, all made things easy for her when she bought something from them. Having lived alone for several years already, every Sunday at about 1pm, she would go to Down Beach to visit her daughter and Bondi and her grandchildren and spend the evening with them. This was her way of breaking away from her weekly routine. Her son-in-law always drove her back at 9pm and the next visit would be arranged for the following Sunday. Such was the peaceful life of Malema, who hated unpredictability, lived. Even though Mbonde had asked her several times to move in with them, she wanted her privacy and still felt very independent. She politely turned down her daughter's offer each time. Shortly after 9am, on the way back from the bakery, whilst the first rays of sunlight were timidly breaking through, she suddenly froze in the middle of the road, and the bread wrapped in a small paper bag fell to the ground. She narrowly missed getting hit by a Ford, which luckily had not been going fast. Malema stood rooted to the spot, not yet aware of the commotion she was causing. The driver of the Ford, whose disconcerted expression betrayed his anxiety, got out and ran over to her. The onlookers and shopkeepers she just greeted did the same. The crowd, in addition to causing a huge traffic jam, attracted the attention of a man who, like everyone else, was making his way over to the old lady. They're all asking the same questions. Are you OK? What's wrong, Mama Annie? We should take her to the hospital. The posse tried to pick up her bread, but on seeing it had been trampled on by the onlookers, she gave up. In the midst of all this, Mulema remained impassive like a wax doll removed from all the fuss. Mohammed gently shook her. She seemed to regain consciousness. Then, without saying a word, he took her hand to help her across the road, distance her from all the excitement and guide her home. She allowed herself to be led. Just then, the man caught up with them and recognised her immediately. Mulema, he said in an emotional voice. She didn't answer. He spoke to the shopkeeper. It's OK, I'll take her home. She's just shaken, nothing serious. I've never seen you around here. 
and certainly not with her, so I'm sorry I can't let her go with you. Annie seemed to have regained her power of speech. She placed her other hand warmly over the shopkeeper's. Thank you, Mohammed. I'm feeling better now. Don't worry, I know him. Okay, Mama, see you then. Mulema and the man walked slowly in an almost awkward silence. She leaned on him and he allowed her to lead him since he didn't know her house. Behind them, rapid footsteps approached and as she turned around to see who it was, Mulema recognized the posse. She gave Annie another loaf of still warm bread. Mulema thanked her and insisted on paying, but Iposi refused. They hadn't seen each other for about 40 years, she and this man, Sander was his name. Despite his age, he, he exuded a certain charm. His mature features showed clearly that he'd been a very good looking man in his day. Wearing a straw hat, a pale pink short sleeved tartan shirt and jeans, he still cut a fine figure. Involved in various humanitarian activities, he traveled the world and never returned to Cameroon. <clears throat> Neither wanted to come back, especially after what happened the last time. I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, so well. that leaves a little bit of intrigue <laughs> at the end, yeah. So, but that's Felicity's work, obviously. And is she back now? Maybe she can talk a bit more about it. Yes, I'm back, I'm back. Thank you, uh, Georgina. Thank you very much for that reading. Felicity, tell, 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 there's a little bit about, about the translation of that story itself. Um, uh, James has asked in the chat how you saw, you were talking just before you got cut off before about um, the, the use of tool um, and, and having to deal with that as part of your translation. Could you maybe talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges you faced and how you came out, uh, how you solved them, how you overcame them? Yes, I um, I started with the, the portion of uh, being unable, uh, looking for um, a way to translate um, that, that uh, idea of tutoyer into English. And, um, I mean, after brainstorming, a lot of brainstorming, uh, uh, I finally translated it with a sir. I think the portion is in the, the, the book. I think I should read it. Let me just uh, read what I did. Uh, where is that? Okay. So um, it's like, Bondi cast a wry smile in her mother's direction, then spoke to Sandra as she walked towards him waiting for him to extend his hand. Good evening, sir. Good evening, young lady. Are you a friend of my mother's? I've never seen you before. And he says, I'm, a, I'm her half brother, so your uncle. You don't need to call me, sir. So that's a portion where uh, 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 Sander told uh, Bondi that uh, so I rendered it as you don't need to call me sir. So that's how we're able to solve that uh, particular portion, which was a little bit challenging. And I also, I also had uh, an issue with the title. When you look at the title in French, it's, um, it's completely different from the title in English. In the course of uh, uh, my translation, that this portion, uh, that title actually had um, uh, uh, a sentence. It's actually a sentence in the translation. It's actually a portion in the translation that I, I just had to pick out. Because when I, 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 I thought of uh, translating the title literary, literally um, as um, the dawn, the dawn of soul mix, it didn't really um, reflect the story. It did not reflect the story, so I uh, we we really had to 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 think of something that will represent both the story and also the title. So in one portion um, in the story, um, uh, Mulema was uh, recounting, uh, talking about the, the 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 fact that if she had contacted Sanda at some point then she would have gone to meet him. So that's where uh, she brought in this expression in French that we translated as 
your feet, your feet uh, will lead you to where your heart is. And we just picked out that portion and use our title and use as our title because actually it reflects um, the story, the entire story. It summarizes the entire story of uh, two uh, people who loved each other. They were separated due to circumstances, and uh, uh, I mean circumstances still brought them together, and the the, the found themselves. I mean, they couldn't do anything. They just had to move on from where, uh, um, uh, uh, from where uh, they moved away. They had to, to to continue from that point when they had met each other. So those, those are uh, a few of the, the the challenges I had. I also we also had um, uh, portions where we had to we had to um, to reduce. To, I mean, to, to look for, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, we had portions where we had to use maybe um, a word to express uh, a sentence in French or a phrase in French. I cannot pick out a particular one, but I think there are so many instances because in most cases, like uh, in English, you 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 use you could use one word to express a, a, a phrase in, in French. So I had, uh, I think, several um, instances like that where I, we needed to compress to 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 reduce uh, the French phrase in English. We didn't need to use many words in English as we did in French. Yeah, and um, really, because at the beginning, if, uh, even my mentor uh, uh, mentioned it, I I was so stopped to the French. I think I had that other challenge. I was so glued to the French text because I um, I didn't know to what extent I could break away from the French text and actually be me and actually be the translator and actually find my voice in, in the translation. So uh, uh, my mentor actually encouraged me to, 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 to try to visualize, to try to visualize what the French was saying and say it in English, in English, that's how would the how would the Englishman, how would the Anglophone person in Cameroon or in Africa or around the world, how would he understand that reality? You, you, she, she explained to me that you don't you don't need to be too tied to the French. You need to break away sometimes, not all, not at all times. You need to break away and then find your voice, but not not too much. Yes, it's it's true. Um, I need to, to, to produce a text that will be pleasing to the target reader, but not uh, too different from the French. So I'll, I equally had that um, challenge. But I mean, when, uh, after the first, then the second, and then the third draft, I think I was, I was getting my tentacles into the translation. And I think uh, this is what we have here right in front of us. And well, um, going forward, going forward, uh, Georgina was talking about uh, the stories I'm currently working on. I um, I was recently contacted by an author from an author from uh, South Africa to to translate two stories. One from um, an author, uh, a, a Kenya-based author, and uh, a French-based author too. France, France, uh, not all based in France, but she's Cameroonian. So um, actually, she she said she 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 decided to to choose to choose uh, an African because I think she thinks an African could uh, readily easily understand um, the realities because of the the story written by uh, uh, the Cameroonian writer is so full with comfortably. We have a lot of comfort in it. And truly, I'm facing, <laughs> I'm really facing challenges with it. I, I, I hope I'll be able to, to uh, overcome those challenges at the end. But the stories are so interesting. They're so captivating. And, um, well, uh, the stories are meant to be read. So she told me to, to translate a bit, uh, a section of the stories that she could use to pitch. And then later on, I could translate everything. And uh, since uh, they'll be used for a reading. So that's where I am now. And um, I think I think it's, 
going forward, it, 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 it keeps on getting interesting. I mean, with, um, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the idea about, I mean, getting a, a story in French and then translating it into English, it's, it keeps getting interesting. It's, it's, I, I don't think I, um, I'm going to stop somewhere. I think it's, it's an experience that um, keeps encouraging me to move forward, even with these uh, stories I'm translating. I mean, they're so challenging, but I, uh, I just, I, I, yeah, sometimes um, I even sleep and I'm dreaming about the stories. I'm thinking about what I could do to make a sentence better, or what I could do to, what, what can I do to turn the sentence that maybe keep the reading, because that's one of the things that our, our mentors told us during the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the workshop, that you, uh, in uh, the tra in literary translation, there is this aspect of keeping the reading, the musicality of uh, the um, the source text, and usually that is so challenging because you need to to get uh, 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 sentences, you need to get uh, words, uh, terminology that will actually match that musicality. So sometimes I find myself dreaming about a, a story I'm translating. Uh, I, I I I bet you it's it's so interesting and. Um, in short, it's really interesting. Oh, it's awesome. That's amazing. It sounds like you've had a, a really amazing experience doing this. And it's great yes, to have I a, a real success story as well. I'm really sorry that we've had so many problems because um, I, I think you've got so much more to say. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to... My video, my video has refused to come on. That's why I just... But that's, uh, I think that's we probably got a better signal. I think sometimes it can't cope with both, with both mm -hmm. images at the same time um, I'm going to have to draw it to a close but thank you so much um, to Georgina to Unfor and to Felicito for, for giving up your time today and, and for um, for sharing your experiences um, the anthology sounds fabulous and, um, and I'll make sure that um, if anybody wants it I know the link has been in the chat as we've been talking anyway and I'll make sure um, that I put the link to it on my um, on the Reading Across Cultures page on Facebook um, but if anybody, I know that with the Eventbrite um, link as well, you um, everybody had my um, my email, and so if you if you want the the link, then you can always contact me via the email that was on there. Um, but I know that if we were in person, we'd be giving you a massive applause. So I'm going to give you a massive applause virtually from everybody in the audience. <laughs> and there they are. There's the hands that have been <laughs> on there. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you really soon for the next um, for the next event that we do in the Arena Crest Coaches. And have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>